I'll call to order the Den County Criminal Justice Collaborating Council. Today is August 8th of 2024. Sarah, are you taking roll? Yes. Go ahead. Present, we have Chair Andrea Nodoff by phone. We've got Vice Chair Judge Meyer. We've got Tony Manager Chris Corbola. Uh, we've got Judge Jim Peterson, uh, Judge Luke Wagner, we've got Sheriff Big, we've got Chief Hollister, um, and we have Josie La Liberty as far as the CJCC, and we've got guests um, Carrie Nearing and um, Lori Radcliffe joining us today. Uh, um, we do not have a quorum, and so I don't believe we can approve the minutes for. Um, February or May, uh, but I am open to public comment. Is there any public comment? There aren't any actions, consideration for actions to be taken by the council. Educational component, DHS, informal and formal services for youth and families. Ladies, you're up. Okay. Um, so we were asked to come and talk about informal and inform formal services um, that we provide on the Family and Children Services Unit. So our unit consists of child protection cases along with youth justice cases, and we also um, have out-of-home care as part of our unit too, which consists of foster care and kinship care. Um, so typically youth and families come to our unit um, either through the CHIPS route, which stands for Child or Children in Need of Protection and our Services, or the Youth Justice route. So I'll talk a little bit about um, both of those. So typically how people come to us for child protection is through a child protection referral. So, which means that there's been a concerns regarding abuse or neglect. And at that point in time, we decide um, based on state statute and state standards, if there um, is, is enough, if there are enough grounds, enough criteria for us to what we call screen in that child protection referral and assign it to an initial assessment worker for um, what's more or less like an investigation, lasts for about 60 days. Um, so if the report is screened in and assigned to a worker, a worker's assigned, they're typically going out with law enforcement and they are determining if there are safety issues or not. Um, it's, we have safety assessments that we go by. We have guidelines in regards to present and impending danger threats. Um, there's a number, number of tools that we use to determine if a child is safe or unsafe. Um, a lot of times people want us to get involved um, because they have general concerns, because of reasons of poverty, um, because some kiddos' life um, might not look the greatest. Um, but we are we're definitely not the quality of life police. We are there um, to assess for safety. And if it's determined to be unsafe, then we are trying to figure out what we can do to make it safe for that kiddo, hopefully in the least restrictive kind of way. Um, so sometimes, um, not sometimes, almost always, honestly, we are really trying to figure out if we can do a protective plan in these situations versus take the children into temporary physical custody and place them elsewhere. That was kind of kind of the old school way of doing it. Um, the state is is definitely, you know, the push is to basically do whatever you need to do to, you know, keep the family unit intact. 
So can we implement safety services into the home right away? Can the kids go with grandma for a period of time while we kind of, you know, get some things set up and put in place? We're just trying to trying to get creative so it's um, really the least amount of disruption to the family unit and to those kiddos as possible. So sometimes we implement a protective plan. Someone violates it. We go to plan B. We like, okay, let's regroup. Let's try another another plan. Sometimes at that point, we're like, okay, all right, we've like we've tried. Um, now we're at the point where we need to get the court involved and we might do like a uh, temporary physical custody at that point or um, ask for a CHIPS petition to, to be filed. But we are typically trying to start off really by doing that engagement piece with the family, really trying to work with them and trying to get creative in regards to figuring out what we can do to um, keep those kiddos in the home. So if, if we um, determine during that, you know, that 60 days that we can work with this family on like a more voluntary basis, they're like, we're willing to work with you. We're willing to have services be put in place. We might do what we call an informal disposition agreement, just basically an agreement between the family and human services, and we'll provide services that way. Um, sometimes we do need to um, file a CHIPS petition, which goes to the district attorney's office and then through the court system. And then um, there's court order conditions that are put in place. So then we're working with the family um, that way. So those would probably can be considered more formal services. Uh, there are what we call child welfare referrals. Um, sometimes we will get a child welfare referral instead of that typical child protection referral like I was just talking about. Sometimes um, somebody will call and they'll be like, oh, I've just, you know, we've been trying to work with this family, it might be the school, it might be a therapist. Um, this family is just really in a situation where we believe that more services are needed. There's no child abuse and neglect concerns, but there, we're just really thinking that, um, you know, that you guys could maybe connect them with some additional community resources, or um, a lot of times we might connect them with CCS, Comprehensive Community Services, or CLTS, which is Children's Long-Term Support. So some families do kind of come in that way um, through the, the child welfare way. It's a, that's totally voluntary. They don't have to, you don't have to call us back. We don't go to the home. We just are like, hey, you know, can we meet with you? Can we talk about services? Is this something that you're interested in? It's voluntary. Um, the other way that families and youth uh, come to us is through the, the youth justice system. So kind of the same there. They come in um, because they were out, you know, they had committed some type of crime. And instead of um, <clears throat> that going to the district attorney's office, it comes to human services for what we call an intake. Our intake worker meets with the youth They meet with the parents um, they're gather gathering collateral information. Um, we're doing what we call a uh, uh, YASI pre-screen on them, uh, which stands for uh, Youth Assessment Screening Instrument. The state, the entire state has has gone to using this. Um, it's a pretty, pretty helpful tool to help guide the intake worker in regards to their decision making as to whether or not they close out that referral um, they do a deferred prosecution agreement or they um, kick that referral over to the district attorney's office for uh, a formal petition. So all of the research says you do not want to be serving those low risk youth. You definitely want to only refer them to community resources that bringing them into the formal youth justice system can actually be more harmful to them and um, produce poorer outcomes. So 
we really do try to um, use that Yazi prescreen. The only thing that that uh, prescreen is not helpful for is sex offenders. Um, so we do have to we do make our own decisions in regards to those sex offense cases. It's it's not vetted for sex offense um, crimes. So the youth justice um, youth, the youth justice kiddos that come through and their families, we kind of serve them very similar than we do in child protection. It's a family unit like the youth might need some help and uh, help and support and to gain some additional skills. But a lot of times the parents do too. The whole family system a lot of times needs assistance and help. And so we're really taking a good holistic approach and um, trying to figure out what really needs to be done in that situation. So like I said before, some of those ones, we do close them out. We refer them to just services in the community that oftentimes their, you know, their own insurance can pay for. Um, a deferred prosecution is basically an agreement between our office and the youth that they're going to do A, B, C, D, and E. If they don't, that deferred prosecution agreement can be revoked and it can be sent over to court. Um, but services are definitely being provided through that deferred prosecution agreement. And then sometimes those higher risk youth do need to be um, sent over to the district attorney's office and, and on a formal petition. And then they are receiving services that way. Um, the Yazi, once, once we decide that we are this youth is going to be receiving ongoing services in our department. We do what we call a full screen on them. And it's a lot more questions, a lot more assessment. And basically what it does is it gives us the three target areas that um, the department and the youth together need to work on. And I really like it a lot because it gives the youth a lot of ownership in, um, in some of the choices that they get to make on this journey. So, you know, it spits out these top three, the top three target areas of the skills, the work that they need to do. And then, and then the workers sitting down with the youth and asking them where they want to start, like what's, what's most important to you? Um, what do you think is going to be the most helpful for you? We can't, we're not obviously going to tackle all of these things all at the same time, but, um, you know, where, where should we begin? And that really seems to work well. And then the workers at, at the six month mark, they're doing another assessment to see how things are looking like. Um, and it's been really, really fun for them, for the workers to really to see that um, risk assessment go down and for the use assess or um, strengths to to come up and they've they've really been liking this tool the more and more that they have um, gotten used to using it it's a little a little complicated a little cumbersome and clunky at the beginning but uh, they're all they're all definitely getting used to it now and really liking it so. I was probably very long winded and more than you all ever wanted to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that is just a tad bit about informal and formal supports that um, Family and Children's provides. Any questions? Um, good question. It's hard to tell. Um, in the youth justice, in the youth justice um, world, a youth is counted as one case. But in the child protection world, the family unit is counted as one case. So you can have five or six kids in that family, but that's counted as one case. Uh, it would be really interesting to count up, you know, the number the number of children versus the number of cases that we have but our um our youth justice workers typically have between 13 to 15 um sometimes more youth on their caseload and we have four ongoing workers 
Now, some of them also have some child protection cases too, because they like to do that, but. Any other questions that anybody has? Just wondering, are there any unmet needs that that you have? I mean, anything that, you know, services or options for kids, uh, service providers um, that we don't have available that over the long haul we might want to? It's, uh, yes, um, definitely um, inpatient AODA for youth. There is virtually, it's virtually non-existent in the state. Um, intensive mental health treatment is really hard to find. Um, if you want a youth to go to juvenile detention, I mean, it is, it's, we don't, we don't try to do it often by any means. I mean, we've probably had a, a youth in juvenile detention, maybe a handful of times in the last five years, honestly, but um, it is very difficult to find. We sat on the phone Thursday night. It was, we had a youth um, who literally just got out of secure detention and was back, you know, punching people and completely out of control again. We wanted her to go back to juvenile detention and called every single one in the state and no, not one of them was able to to take her so and sometimes it's like oh my gosh what do you do then you know like what what do you do and you got to get creative and in that situation thankfully she was able to go with a family member for the night she had physically assaulted her mom who she was living with she was able to go to a different family member for the night and then they had a a bed open the the following day but yeah, some of those nights you're you're calling, 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 calling for hours and hours and hours. Same with placements, especially for um, for youth. Not a lot of people want to take in um, teenagers who don't look so good on paper. So is the detention center at capacity or is it staffing issues that they have that they can't take? Sometimes both. Um like some, well, this wasn't that long ago. I called over there and they were having a COVID outbreak, so they weren't taking anyone. Um, but it was the other day. It was just a a shortage of beds, and, and that can change with the drop of a hat. Again, last week I think I had to call too, and that's not normal <laughs> for right. what's supposed to be calling. I didn't call them in years, probably. Yeah, but. There are no placements for kids in general. And I called every single positive alternatives group home that night. Um, two of them were having, were on critical staffing shortages and were not able to take a placement. So, and one, the other one was full, but yeah, just sometimes you're left like, oh, what are we going to do? Yeah. Are we going to have to sleep here tonight with this <laughs> child? Anything else? Any other questions by folks uh, that are appearing virtually? Oh, this is Andrea. I guess I, if you could just speak to when we have these informal placements where they're not being referred to the court or the DA's office, um, you know, how often a social worker is going out to check on the kids and the families and um, what that looks like. Is it just like six months and you check in or I know it could depend on on every sure. case. Yeah, right. Every like everything in our line of work, it depends, right? Um, a lot of times with these informals, we are doing either six months or a year. Um, lengthwise. Lengthwise, yeah. exactly. Lengthwise. So it's standard. I mean, it's standard practice to do a once a month check in um a lot of times it's it's definitely more than than once a month that families are um you know having a home visitor being contacted by a social worker um 
An informal placement also could be like kinship care, though. We have a lot of kinship families. We have a lot of um, children who are living with relatives. And if they don't have an open case with human services, if safety issues have been mitigated, the case has been closed, um, they can be in this kinship care agreement, basically. And that we do have a kinship care worker. Um, she goes out two times per year. That's what the standard is for that. Two times per year to um, go do a home visit and check up on things. But those, they're not really receiving case management services. And typically all of the, you know, the safety issues have been mitigated in those circumstances, those situations. You don't have any children out of um, in out of home care that is um, through a safety plan or through kinship care when they're institutionalized. Is that correct? No, right, correct. So your numbers are dropping. Is that fair to say? Chips numbers, just um, um, delinquency numbers, gyps numbers dropping. Yeah, I think they are lower. Okay, they have been in years past, definitely. How much lower do you think they are? Youth justice numbers are definitely down. I think that's due to um, a lot of work, honestly, that they're doing in the Menominee School District. Um, so definitely want to give them credit and to the um, the officers that are there, the youth service officers. They really, really are trying to figure out, does this youth need to be referred to human services for a crime or is this, you know, can we have them do a program, um, do some things and then figure out from there if it needs to be referred. But were I, child protection numbers overall, our assessments, our number of referrals are the same. They're the same. Um, but our place, I would say our right placements, now, their placement numbers are higher than typical because of the number of large siblings. Yes. Groups that we have. I think that has. Yeah. So we have several families that have four to five kids. Right. So that really skews numbers. Otherwise, I think our out of home placement numbers would look very, very different. Yeah, we're like, there was like four, we have four families and I think they, you know, it was like 22 kids or something. I'm like, if we weren't serving these four families, we'd have like 10 or 12 kids in placement, you know? Mm -hmm. So it just makes all the difference. Yep. So you don't have to remove kids. You could do a CHIPS action. You could refer to the district attorney's office without removing the children. Absolutely. Yes. And and what's the consequence of doing it differently? Positive and negative. The positive to removing kids? But you no. Like a... no, not not the positive to removing kids. I I I, I no, I'm not Sorry. asking what the positive to removing kids is. My question is because there there's very few positives to removing children. Right. Um my question is, um, the numbers for CHIPS cases have gone down. Yes? Yeah. And my question is, you don't have to remove a child to have a CHIPS action. Right. Right? We all agree on that, right? Yes. And so my question is, if you choose not to do a CHIPS action, not to refer the matter to the district attorney's office for CHIPS cases, mm -hmm. not for juvenile delinquents or for juvenile, because we can talk about that in the in a minute, what's the positive and negatives of of changing that way of doing of doing business so to speak yeah what are the positive and negatives to doing it that way i think the positive is you know really when the initial assessment worker goes out there and they meet a family and the family is like i am willing to work with you guys i want change in our family i want things to be different like hook me up you know, and and so we start to implement services and 
it like they're already doing what they need to be doing. You know, they're basically voluntary at that point. So we're like, and typically though, that's, those are the ones that are kind of the first, first time around our first, you know, first involvement with them. And so you're not feeling like you need that court order or that you would want to put the family through having to, you know, go to court and be in a chips petition and those kinds of things. Um, so that's definitely a positive, I think, is that you're you're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're already doing the work. They're willing to work with you. And you're like, let's let's go this way. You know, it feels good um, that you have that partnership and that relationship and that they're basically doing what you would want them to do anyways if they were on a formal order. Um, probably the negative would be, you know, if something goes awry <laughs> during the course of that, then we're kind of starting over and um, figuring out if we need to get the court involved at that point. And but I think it's it's definitely willing to or you know worth it to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. But if things are go awry, mm -hmm. which is not a small matter, right? Right, and not a small number either. I mean, it's not a small. It's not small that things could go awry, and that the consequences of things going awry um, are serious, and. I would imagine, and of course I'm not in your office, it's not a small number of things, of cases where things go awry either, right? I mean, no. you know, we don't have cases from two th for years because things went perfectly all the time. Exactly. I mean, we don't. And so the question in my mind, and I, I suppose I ask this, but maybe I'll ask it in a different way, or maybe I'll ask it in the same way. Um, What's the consequences? It's not just the consequence of, but it's not just the consequence of things going awry and you have to redo it, right? I mean, that's not just the mm -hmm. consequence. My question would be, what's the consequence of not sending it to the district attorney's office? Are there consequences to that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Not, not necessarily um, because, again, we all are aware that that you can do a chips action without doing a TPC, right? Right, and so what's the consequence of not doing that chips action and continue? If your numbers are down, that means that you're continuing to not do that chips action. Yes, I mean it has to be right. If your numbers are way down, well, uh, for I think chips that, filing, right? It I was, mean chips filing. I think over the years that CCS and CLTS have helped out a lot too. Before, family and children's used to basically be the only avenue to provide service to families. And over the years, now we have comprehensive community services and a lot of um, children's long-term support waiver uh, workers. Like, it's blown up in our department. So a lot of those families are getting served through CCS and CLTS. They can receive respite. They can receive, they can... The kids can go to camp. The parent can receive parenting services. They can have, you know, um, formal supports come into their home on the daily. No, I mean, it really kind of depends on, on what the family needs. And so if there aren't these blaring safety issues, then we're getting families served by CCS and CLTS. And then, you know, after a period of time, then we're bowing out. So they're served in a different capacity, but they're definitely served. We were only talking about the CHIPS cases, um, the Child and Native Protection or Services. W what about the GIPS case? Now, the GIPS or the Delinquency, Juvenile Need and Protection mm -hmm. or Services, or the Delinquency, those numbers are down as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you tell me what are, um, so if those numbers are down as well. And thank you very much, Menominee School District. I I praise them 
very often, right? Um, what are the other positive and negative consequences to um, the smaller number of referrals to the district attorney's office? For those GIPS cases? Mm -hmm. and, and delinquencies. And delinquencies. I would say the same. Um, I would say a lot of times those, you know, those youth and those family, they're hitting the radar of um, CCS and CLTS, especially those GIPS kind of out of control kids. And so sometimes we'll be contacted by, you know, a CCS worker or supervisor and say, okay, we've tried a number of things. Now we're thinking that maybe, you know, it's time for a GIPS petition. So we talk that through. Um, but yeah, we're, I mean, definitely trying to serve those youth and those families in those systems. And the schools are, the schools have CCS and CLTS on, on speed dial. So they're really trying to um, connect those youth and those families up with those voluntary services before they have to have a juvenile referral or child protection referral. So I think it's an I think it's just a nice combination really of all everybody kind of working together and and just having a more broadened um, scope of of services that are available to our citizens. Well, and the ne a negative to a juvenile being a delinquent can follow them when they go to go to apply for jobs or different avenues of military. And we often believe that those things are sealed and they're not. And so that is a negative to having a kid adjudicated a delinquent unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, there's no question that that the whole bad apple thing, a, a bad apple doesn't turn the whole bunch. A bunch of good apples doesn't make that one bad apple good. However, that one bad apple can make a whole bunch of ap apples bad and putting those children um, or anybody to that effect, um, mixing populations is not the brightest, um, is not the best idea. So I'm not disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. Just thought it might be something you'd want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you um, get to tell us everything that you think that for a snapshot we should know? Um, in a snapshot, yes. <laughs> There's a lot more, but <laughs> we don't we have, have that much time. <laughs> Does anyone else have any further questions? I would just invite anybody to what we do is super confusing. And it's like, you know, I mean, if you have questions in regards to a, a certain case or um, you know, why did you guys do it this way? Or why do you do it that way? I would say it just, just call us and ask us because we're more than happy to talk things through. There's so many different factors that get taken into consideration in every single situation that comes across our desk. And, um, so I would just, I would just invite anybody to just call if they have questions, because we're certainly happy to chat yeah. that through. One question I might have is just from a just from an individual of a community, is there a way that a, a community member could say, hey, we're available if you've got an individual that's you know, in trouble, but maybe nonviolent, uh, here's our name, give us a call, we could lend a bed for the night type of thing? Yeah, there definitely is. And is that it, considered a program or is it just considered reach out to you and say, here I am? That um, that would be like a, like a respite situation. So, you know, somebody, We'd have to have a, you know, do a background and a home visit and and things like that. It's not a huge process. It's not like becoming to become a licensed foster parent. But if you said, you know, we're, yeah, we would be willing to be a respite provider and have youth come for a night or two, or if they need a break away from their, you know, whatever's going on at home to give them a breather. Um, yeah, that would definitely be welcomed. Well, I see, you know, community members, you know, we have an extra room type thing and, and some of the, you know, the, some of the people that used to work for the city and or uh, retired policemen or retired firemen, or um, there might be a, a group of people out there, you know, that could offer that. But 
I guess I wouldn't even know where to turn to, or if I've never heard of saying, hey, community member, we need your help. Mm -hmm. And here's a number to call if you're available. Yeah. Um, you know, I could see like Randy ID and his, his wife's a uh, retired minister and, you know, he was in the military. He'd be perfect for something like this. Or my brother Don would be a, another candidate or you know, some, somebody like us that's got an extra room that, you know, we could take on somebody that's got a, a you know, needs a bed for the night type thing or, but, but is there any way to put this out in the community that says, hey, if you're available or would have a desire to do this, you can contact our office type thing? We really haven't done like a, I mean, we kind of go, we go to different events and stuff and talk about, but it's more about foster care, um, not so much about respite care, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely something to look at. It sounds like you have a lot of connections. Well, I could, too, so. you know, like, um, you <laughs> know, we'll call you. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll get well, your like, number. <laughs> well, like Sheriff Smith, for instance, you know, he'd be perfect at this kind of thing, or Low Prangy, or Randy ID, or you know, several people that have been retired from, you know, either Sheriff's Department or, I mean, there's got to be some people out there that would lend a hand, if it's a, you know, a night or two type of thing. Take the kid fishing the next day. Hey, we're gonna get up and we're gonna go fishing, and you know, that type of thing, just as a Temporary intervention. Uh -huh. It's a little quite a bit different if you're going to adopt somebody or take somebody in for a long term. Long period. Yes. But, you know, and we've talked about that, at, at, but, you know, we're just not set up for that. But if it was an emergency situation, you know, yeah, you could call us and say, yeah, we'll, we can come and pick that person up and we'll get them straightened around for a day or two type yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm just, just wondering if that exists or if you could promote that to let community members know that hey, we need your help type thing. Right. Even if you could announce it in a church, say, hey, church A, and next week, hey, church B, you know, if there's any community members that could assist us, that might be an avenue for you as all. Well. Right, yeah. I think we have done that in the past, the church, but I mm -hmm. do think that that's something we can um, revisit, that um, it is key to involve the community members that are willing to just be community members to their to the kids and the youths. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great idea. Well, we've taken it. I mean, I've had a friend of mine call me and say, hey, we've got a family emergency and or, hey, is any way I can't get I'm stuck in traffic. Can you go and pick up a kid at school? Mm -hmm. I'll call a school and tell them you're coming. And sure, yeah, no problem. But right. there might be a better community uh, communication piece that could be um, offered to the to to the city and or county to say, hey, you know what, if you got, you know, got the uh, availability or ability yeah. To help out, we need your help. Yep. Andrea, sorry. I was, I don't know if you heard me, but uh, you can go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just really quickly with the GIPS cases that get um, on an informal or, you know, don't get referred don't get filed for charges. Is anyone from human services checking with the victim, assuming it's a criminal damage to property or a sexual assault to ensure the victim's input is being um, taken into consideration when determining whether to file charges or refer it to our office? Yes, yes. So if, uh, uh, not so much in those GIPS ones, because those are more in those those juvenile and need of protection and or services. So typically there's not a, a victim involved in that one. But if they're coming through um, juvenile intake and meeting with Tracy, our intake worker, um, yes, their paperwork is automatically sent out to the victim. Um, they're asked if they want to write a statement. They're... Um, we don't get statements back. We're reaching out with a phone call to see, um, you know, uh, to make sure that, you know, they have an opportunity for, for their voice to be heard. So that's part of that process. Okay, great. Does anyone have any other questions? Thank you, ladies, for coming. We appreciate coming and talking to us. Maybe getting a snapshot education. Moving on on the calendar, we have the local criminal justice data snapshot, which is um, you got a handout, and I'll turn the floor over to Sarah.
different things. Um, so we'll go into some data. Okay, hey, um, first thing, uh, first slide here with some local data. This is clerk of court data, 2019 through 2023. Um, you can see the trend lines there. Um, you know, looking overall, um, these are just big categories, felony, misdemeanor, and ordinances, but we are seeing um, the felony numbers are um, on par with the five-year average, but they're up from the 17-year average. And I use 17-year average because Katie sent me a spreadsheet with 17 years of data. So I'm like, all right, we'll kind of see where we're at. Um, five years data, we're still getting those COVID numbers in there. So, you know, the numbers were artificially kind of dipped down. So just wanted to look back a little bit further. Uh, looking at the misdemeanors, um, we had 523 in uh, 2013 or 23, and that is higher than our five year average of 458, um, but, you know, relatively on par with that 17 year average. Uh, looking at ordinances, these are the non-traffic ordinances. Um, the numbers definitely uh, dipped in 2023, uh, lower than the five-year average and the 17-year average um, overall. Moving on to the next slide. And I suppose holler if you've got questions or anything catches your eye. Um, Looking at um, some of the juvenile data, so the juvenile chips, 2023, but there were 39 um, case filings um, in 2023. That is significantly lower than what we have seen in the uh, five-year average um, and the 17-year average. Um, looking at uh, the TPRs, the termination of parental rights, those numbers kind of wavering up and down, but um, we were at 13 for 2023. Uh, juvenile, civil, and ordinance violations, um, kind of on average, a little bit lower than the five-year average, but not too far from that 17-year average. Um, but looking at the juvenile delinquency numbers, yeah, the, the numbers are definitely down. So 2023, there were 38 formal case filings. Um, not too far from that five-year average, but look at the 17-year average was 60. So the, the trend is definitely in the right direction. Can I just mention that Parental uh, termination of parental rights is 13. Is that including all of the county versus the department's termination? This is just clerk of court yeah. filings. Okay. okay, so it wasn't necessarily just the, the terminations we filed. Correct. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yep. Moving to the next, a uh, little snapshot of the jail. Um, so the jail average daily population this year through June uh, is 93, and that is 19% increase over last year's number. So um, if you recall, there was um, a um, constitutional amendment that was passed, and there was different factors that can be taken into account with um, setting um, um, bond and conditions of release. Uh, we noticed our data last year that the numbers were starting to creep up, and we did see that August or that April is kind of the start of the, the numbers creeping up. So um, the numbers are up overall um, for the jail. Um, so we are kind of back to that pre-COVID uh, numbers overall. Um, as far as the, the jail or the law enforcement proxy, so these are kind of those quick risk screeners that uh, law enforcement are doing when they have contact with somebody that is um, either at ordinance violation, misdemeanor, felony level um, offense. Um, those numbers are really on par with um, the, the what we've seen in previous years. Um, we, we're continuing to see um, the sheriff's office um, both last year and this year um, sending more proxies um, our way, so that's fantastic. Um, but when we kind of take an estimate of the numbers, we're, we're probably on par with getting an 800 through the end of the year. So um, that's just a helpful tool that law enforcement can use um, to help them make those decisions to um, whether to file a, a formal um, case with the DA's office or may offer a ref, uh, diversion um, or really kind of take into account some of those factors. Moving to the next one, uh, pretrial assessment information. So this is, um, we've got staff that goes into the jail and meets with everybody that was um, booked and held for a bond appearance or a jail intake. Um, so we had 398 um, through uh, June 30th. 
35% of those are failures to appear. So that contins, continues to be a, a major um, a proportion of, of those um, individuals. Um, the uh, drug screens that were completed by these individuals, it's a voluntary option for people to um, take part in the drug screen. We had 134 during that time. Um, and as you can see, alcohol was um, identified as the most problematic substance. A um, little bit different than what we've seen last year. It was um, meth was going down and alcohol was slightly ahead. Um, so the meth rates continue to drop as far as what people self-disclose. Uh, alcohol's um, increasing, which is interesting. And then you can see the opioids is pretty negligent of somebody to strictly opioid use um, issues. And, you know, a whopping 20%, 19% are saying, I don't have any problems with drugs or alcohol. So sometimes they say that the first time, and then the next time they come back, they're a little bit more open um, at different times. So, um, Part of this pretrial assessment process is also early referrals. So you can see we've had 39 referrals from this pool of individuals for treatment court, 100 referrals for the treatment opportunity program, and then one of the individuals was identified as maybe most appropriate for family treatment court. So that's just from that, that jail uh, population or pre-booking population, essentially. Um, looking at some of the program data, um, and again, we're just wanting to take a little snapshot of where we're at and compare that to with our averages. So uh, law enforcement deflection, that's that Project HOPE activities out there where they're deflecting. We got our behavioral health officers, both the city police and the county um, going out there and identifying people at risk and making treatment referrals. So um, we've had 25 people um, through June 30th, so not far from our last year's rates. Uh, these these folks tend to be high need, a lot of a lot of needs going on with these these individuals. So the number of contacts is way more than the number of individuals, um, but those are getting served by our BHOs. Um, a behavioral health officer, thank you for sorry for talking in code. <laughs> Um, let's see, pre-charge, uh, law enforcement diversion, that is also kind of a new pathway that our behavioral health officers are working on. We've only had one formal uh, law enforcement diversion, um, but that is getting up and running and hope to have more trickle through this year. Um, our existing pre-charge diversion program through the DA's office, um, they are um, serving 28 uh, individuals this year. So uh, compared to last year or a five-year average, they're they're kind of on par with that. Um, with top, we've had 41 so far this year. So we're we're definitely going to be exceeding um, our average, um, which is great. We this past year we really moved a full-time staff into that position. So it's nice to see so many people coming through. Treatment court and family treatment court also have more enrollment this year than we've almost seen in, in the full last year. Uh, treatment court this year, we've got 25 we've served. All of last year, we served 28. So there's a lot of folks coming through that program. Same with family treatment court. We've served 17 year to date. Um, you know, last year we had 16 total. So we're only halfway through the year. So we got a lot of folks coming through those programs. Um, treatment in jail. So this is... Um, not only the medication-assisted treatment in jail, so for people with opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, uh, 12 were served in the jail. And then we also have um, the substance use counselor in jail offering um, counseling services to um, anybody really has needs. So that is outside. It doesn't matter what your, you know, the drug issue is, um, but her capacity is 12 at any one time. Um, so 24 people um, being served um, out of the jail's uh, treatment program um, where we're at. So any questions, I guess, on some of the data um, that we covered? Things are Things are working, people are getting referred, people are getting served, people are getting through programs. Um, I know we've got a lot of court cases hanging out there, a lot of referrals hanging out there pending, you know, the decisions, but um, yeah, things are, things are going well. Back to you, Judge Meyer. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah? Um, moving into the Grants update. 
I think that's you too, Sarah. Yes. Thank you. And we're probably over time, but we're gonna we're gonna finish this quick here. So on the last slide of the handout, and I've got the slide up, um, just giving a quick snapshot of our, our grants. So we're, uh, you know, 2024 here, right in the middle of the of the sheet, but moving into 2025. So all of our grants, other than one small um, medication assisted treatment grants are getting continued or renewed for 2025. The amounts are a little bit different, um, but we've been able to kind of adjust. Um, but overall, we're pretty solidly funded through 2026. Um, some of the grants um, are multiple year grants and some are not. Um, we did uh, put in a pre-application um, for an additional $100,000 for a treatment court. Um, those The full applications will come out later this year, so um, no guarantees on additional funding there. But we will get a um, the renewal um, of um, the law enforcement deflection grant. That'll be a new one for 140. We're getting our TAD grant for 166,000. Uh, we're getting our family treatment court is almost 300,000 um, that we have. Um, and then we've got the medication assisted treatment. Both of those grants combined um, at about $165,000. And we've got pending applications for other funds. So, but that's the update. Any questions? Sarah, you got three minutes before we're over program. And I think the staff report is you and agency updates is you as well. A staff report was, a uh, written staff report was in the packet. I just want to add that the state is starting to come out with the state opioid settlement dollar grant opportunities. So we are taking a peek at a law enforcement deflection diversion uh, possible grant to help support um, Project Hope with the, both the city and the county. Um, and really just trying to keep these programs up and running and growing and viable and uh, just the impact that they're reaching and the, the positive um, impression that they're leaving with the people they're working with is pretty remarkable. So um, that can just um, lend a helping hand in a lot of different ways. So that's all my update. And then agency, it's everybody else, not me. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for all the work you do. We really appreciate it. Um, is there any agency updates? I just uh, mentioned that Becca is moving into a full-time investigator position and, and uh, vacating the BHO position. So Dylan Christ will be moving into the BHO position August 25th. That's a good choice. He's very uh, level-headed. Um, anyone else? Uh, a, the um, next meetings are listed on the um, Notice of Public Meeting, which is um, the Executive Committee and the Operations Committee is September 11th. The next CJC quarterly meeting is November 21st at 4 p.m. Um, I think we just hit it like right one minute. We have one extra minute if anybody wants to talk. They don't have that, so just wanted to make a comment oh. that we could all be. Your microphone's not on. <laughs> 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 Your microphone's not on. Oh. <laughs> so we say in court, microphone, microphone, microphone. Speak into the microphone, right? Thank you, ladies, for coming. We appreciate you uh, um, coming here and um, talking to us. And we'll, um, does anybody have a motion for adjournment? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any any opposed? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>